Good evening, fathers and sororas, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, very much uh, delighted to have the opportunity to be with you and uh, Rosicrucians and, and those who are interested in these things this evening uh, here on the eve of, of Christmas. And um, you know, the, the topic here uh, entitled The Pearls of Wisdom of the Mass of Jesus uh, uh, comes out of uh, some experiences uh, in my life as a, a, a very young man. Uh, and my interest at, at one time in my life in pursuing the ministry, and it led me into uh, really beyond my kind of parochial school education into really looking at the words of, uh, of Jesus and, and the Gospels uh, as they're reported, but particularly the, the words of Jesus. And uh, those things have stuck with me, the wisdom of them, and granted it is one of many traditions, uh, there's so much wisdom, right? Uh, uh, given to us from around the world uh, and throughout kind of recorded history. Uh, but I've been amazed over and over again by the depth of wisdom of uh, this uh, very illumined personality that uh, came to be with humankind and to share that wisdom. And so before kind of taking that dive, I wanted to, because it very much connects with Christmas, uh, and before kind of diving into those specifics, but very much kind of looking at Christmas and would say the mystical symbolism of Christmas. And undoubtedly there's uh, many ways to, to, to dig into this well beyond what uh, uh, this presentation will, will offer. I'm just gonna briefly touch on this, uh, but in you know pondering it, uh, there were just some thoughts that uh, I thought might be worthwhile sharing uh, uh, tonight because here we are on the eve of Christmas. And uh, we can look at this, uh, of course, there's you know, lots of his, this debate about the historical accuracy and the different accounts of, of uh, the birth of Jesus. Uh, uh, but there's another level uh, or an angle of perspective one could look at this as, and I think uh, in doing it, uh, we can see things in it that we may not have, may not have been called to our attention. Uh, and, and this birth, this nativity, which we kind of symbolize uh, by this birth and, you know, putting the little figure of Jesus perhaps in the manger, if one was brought up in that tradition, uh, but that each one of us can recognize uh, the birth of the Christ child or soul essence within us. And I think if we kind of look at the Christmas narrative, the, the birthday, the birth narrative, we'll see that uh, it is a message for all of us. It, it is not really simply the whatever historical meaning it may have, uh, but it is speaking to something uh, about all of us. Uh, like the Christ child, uh, the soul essence right, is not fathered by a man's uh, seed and the woman's egg uh, uniting, but we know it comes from God itself. And I think all of us know when we look at an infant that while we see the body and can see the resemblance perhaps in the color or the eye color or the skin color of the parents, uh, but at the same time, when we're looking at that infant, we know that those parents were not responsible for the soul within it, for that person, that essence there, notwithstanding what we can see about the similarities of the physical characteristics. Uh, and as I suspect any parent realizes, uh, there is a, a different, there's an independent soul personality, independent from the parents that uh, inhabits that body and soon that uh, that fact makes itself kind of apparent uh, so while the parents give rise to the body uh, they do not give rise to the soul right so that's true and not only their 
in the quote unquote baby Jesus and the narrative of the baby Jesus. Uh, but it is true for us as well. So in many ways, and I just want you to reflect on this, uh, we are all the offspring of a virgin birth. We are not uh, the essence of us. The essence of us is not created by humankind and by human uh, procreation. But the essence of us uh, comes from an extension of the God consciousness uh, or the soul in the material world. So this depiction, this story, this uh, Christmas narrative uh, really reflects what is taking place every time a soul comes into this world. Uh, yes, uh, there is a part of, of that uh, personality that we get to know that is the fruit or the offspring of the parents, but the essence of that uh, individual is, is not the product of, of two physical human beings. It is something that really is an extension of the God consciousness, uh, once again appearing in the material world in, another, in the form of another personality. So this, if we perhaps think about the babe in the manger and uh, think about it as it reflects on each of us and our own uh, spiritual coming into this world, right? That, that story is our story. And let us all kind of find the, recognize the, what that means about us, about who and what we are, about our origin. So, you know, the, the saying from the, the scripture says the word was made flesh. And we know in that sense, the word being the divine thought, the divine utterance, but coming into being incarnate. So the realization of the soul as the essence of our being, and this is where we can have this birth. And all of us who are on this call we have the we have we have had this birth, this spiritual awakening enough to bring us to the portals of the symposium or to the Rosicrucian order, however we've we've come here, uh, because uh, that is that indication of this realization of the soul as the essence of our being, and kind of beginning that life journey which we could say for which Jesus as a divine messenger laid out a path in his words in life. So Christmas uh, is Christmas for each of us. It's not simply about a historical uh, situation, which you know, with its various accounts, uh, but it really is a spiritual birth and that the spiritual birth, uh, we it represents our own existence. And this, you know, let us use Christmas and Christmas Eve to think of our own spiritual birth, right? That the word was made flesh, uh, that that which we are, this essence of conscience and awareness is not the fruit of the physical procreation process, but something that comes from on high, so to speak. And in that way, every piece of this narrative <clears throat> and we see actually fits us in our soul. So let's look at Christmas uh, beyond the historical, recognize it as a reflection of our own experience. Also recognizing that very often we are not fully conscious of it but we have a chance and opportunity to turn our consciousness to it too. <clears throat> so to speak, en enliven that awareness. And when we enliven that, enliven that awareness, it's like a seed that we plant and we kind of got there and it waters it a bit, puts a little bit of sunshine on it. 
so that it grows and grows more rapidly and grows healthily. So just wanted us to lead into this uh, as we look at Christmas and these words that we get from this great mystically illumined figure, Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus the Christ, but that Christ we know is in all of us. And of course, and during Jesus' ministry, <clears throat> excuse me, he, he obviously spoke of many, many things. Uh, what we'll do tonight is, is kind of concentrate on, I think a particularly interesting aspect of what we can learn through his teachings. Uh, and uh, it, it really relates to this, let's say attuning to the love of God. And that's kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, I think very fitting for around Christmas because in many ways, uh, the essence of Christianity very often centers on this notion. And, and I think we've all seen in the public space where uh, signs are held up, <clears throat> excuse me, saying John 3.16, third chapter, 16th verse. And for those uh, people and many Christians, this is the central tenet of their faith and is celebrated at Christmas, right? This is kind of the celebration. And that, for those who are not familiar with it, uh, John 3.16 uh, is, quote, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever so believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting, have everlasting life. So for God so loved the world. So that's kind of a central piece of it. It is what Christmas represents. And what we really wanted to explore this evening is trying to help us bridge the disconnect between uh, this truth uh, and what is very often everyday human experience and, and the gap between it. And I'm going to put this at a kind of, uh, uh, I think something that really kind of gets to the, also the essence of how many human beings experience this. I'm going to put it this way. Don't mean to be glib, but it kind of gets it. So kind of, okay, God did that 2000 years ago. What has done God? What has God done for us lately? All right? Where is the love today? So as human beings see the turmoil and the uh, suffering and this emotional and physical and other uh, things that humans go through that are uncomfortable and unpleasant. Uh, it's very often hard for humans to uh, recognize, well, okay, that was an event that people declare in Christianity happened 2000 years ago. Well, God, what's God been up to since? Uh, because this love, when the midst of all what seems to be so much suffering and turmoil uh, seems to be hidden. And, and not visible and hard to see for people. Uh, so uh, wanted, wanting to explore that with us as Rosicrucians and as those who are on the path uh, to look at how we might come to understand this. And again, I'm just referring to this a, a section as attuning to the love of God. So that's kind of keep that in the back of uh your mind as we're speaking about these things, but attuning to the love of God, right? So you can, I think, reflect on that as we go along here a little bit. But one of, one of my favorite quotes uh, that comes out of Matthew chapter seven, verses nine through 11, Jesus says, he asks this question and it sets up a path of thinking, questioning, and thinking, and, and searching uh, that leads to deeper and deeper understanding. So Jesus asks, he says, Oh, what man is there of you, whom if his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children how much more shall your father which is in heaven 
give good things to them that ask him. So I want to I want to read that again. I'm sure most of us have you know heard this, but I want to read it again. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, and here evil is being used in a relative term, how much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? So it sets up an interesting question or an interesting premise. So, you know, could the creation in terms of love be superior to the creator? Could we be more loving than the, the creator? Is anything greater than its source? Can the kind of extension be greater than the source it comes from? Can humans, being evil as we are, limited as we are, ignorant as we are, know how to give good things for those we love, our children and others? Could the creator be less, be inferior to the creation in terms of this expression of love? In many ways, it would make no sense. Somehow that the, the extension is greater than the source. We know from our experience, things are greatest at their source. They get diluted and weakened further from their source typically. So how do we understand this? What, what's wrong with the equation? So we've got this set, set of facts, right? We as evil as we are, as limited and ignorant and, and kind of uh, ignorant in our perspectives we are, know how to do good things for those that we love. So could the creator that created us be inferior to us in this way? So we have to stand back uh, with that question. Louis-Claude de Sematon, and I, uh, please, I ask the French to forgive, French speakers got to forgive my pronunciation, but uh, uh, is a, one of the great mystical philosophers in, in my experience of my having exposure for other, you know, many, many others we all know. Uh, but one of my favorite quotes of his, and I'm going to truncate it a little bit and so on, but he said, man is a thought of God. And how could he but not love his own thought? So man or humankind is a thought of God. How could he but not love his own thought? Now, so we've got an interesting uh, set of facts. We've got humans, as limited and ignorant as we are, know how to do good things and show love uh, for those that we care about. And then man, humankind is a thought of God. How can you not love his own thought? God despises his own thought. And then we kind of put those and it leaves us with a question again, can the creation be superior to the creator in terms of love? How improbable is that, right? So how do we solve this conundrum? We've got a set of facts that in some ways don't make a lot of sense when you put them together. What's the bridge? One other related point is that if you've, read studies on people having near-death experiences, NDEs as they're called. And there's a good deal of scientific literature on this uh, where people have scientists or investigators uh, kind of using some of the scientific method of copy down and examined uh, their accounts and, and, and probed them to see if it was just imagination, et cetera. But so uh, the accounts are reliable when put to the, a reasonable test uh, by a person who is unbiased uh, uh, about the subject. But what's interesting is that individuals often re report during this experience 
the presence of an all-encompassing love. All right. So what the heck is the matter? What's going on here? All right, we've got, we as humans know how to show love, right? We've got this wonderful thought from the Claudius Matan, man is a thought of God. How could he not love his own thought? We have Jesus, pretty good source. Which of you <laughs> would give you know, uh, your, your child a, a stone if they ask for bread? Uh, so, and then you have this, ex these experiences of near death experiences where individuals often report a feeling, I mean, commonly report a feeling of the presence of all encompassing love. So that then comes, leads to the question. So what is missing in our earthly experience that we don't perceive that love or that love this way? So what is missing in our earthly experience? So we got what, what seemed to be a lot of evidence that, hmm, that, it must exist, and it does exist. We see from the end, the near-death experiences. Our logic tells us it exists because we ourselves are loving and the improbability of the creation being greater than its source, its creator in this way. And then we have these near-death experiences. People go through them and wow, the love, et cetera. So you say, well, what is missing in our earthly experience that we don't perceive this love? This we want to talk about attuning to the love of God. I want to ask you to think about it perhaps differently than you ordinarily do or have, don't know. But I want you to think about it, about attuning to the love of God. Hmm. Tuning to the love of God, attuning to the love of God. So let's imagine if you bear with this conversation or this trend of thought, bear with me, so to speak. Imagine that uh, there's a radio signal, it's a cosmic radio signal, and that we uh, kind of have like a radio receiver. And for those of us who were born before everything became digital, in which you had to tune your radio, right? You gotta kind of tune it in to kind of get the station. And if you weren't tuned in really tightly, right? You got a lot of static and hissing and other things, right? Signal comes and goes. And if you really don't have a good kind of fix on a station, uh, the music or the weather, whatever, it kind of comes in and goes out a bit. Right? Very much like people's lives, right? Very much like people's lives. Their moments, things seem to be going really nice. They're tuning in, they're getting it. And other times it just seems like chaos and static and, and dissonance. So I want you to imagine uh, that one can attune to the love of God. We as humans are capable of tuning in to that, to that frequency, to the frequency, to get on the station. It's just like in everyday life, as we tune in closer to the frequency of a station, we hear or experience more of what is being transmitted and more of it's being transmitted uh, and, and more clearly. So we as humans uh, might have to do what perhaps seems improbable to us, but uh, there is, there is one can tune one's radio. And in this case, our radio is our consciousness. Our radio is our consciousness. This up here, that's our radio receiver. So now it also works with this right here, the heart. I'm going to point to it. You can't see it on the screen. So those two kind of work the tuning together. So, but I want you to imagine because we kind of said we got a fact set that says, hold it. NDEs, people feel that love. We show love to others that we love. We say, gee, it can't be that God's worse than us. Uh, Jesus is a pretty good uh, you know, logic to it presented as well. And so what we do know is something's missing. And we want to suggest here, and we see it uh, in our Rosicrucian teachings. Uh, and actually, there was a wonderful Rosicrucian reflection 
sent around uh, just yesterday or the day before. And it was by our former imperator, Christian Bernard. And he talked about harmonium and, and, and har harmony. And that's really about tuning uh, our radios, so to speak. So what we want to look at is how can we go about tuning uh, our radios, tuning into this love of God? Uh, one thing I would also say to you, keep in mind that I think what we'll find, and there are undoubtedly many, many levels of this that are beyond what, you know, it's going to be shared here in, in, in these remarks or this presentation. Uh, but one uh, underlying idea around this seems to be an awareness and recognition of the oneness of creation. That, that's a key to the frequency, key to the frequency. If you, you go down that avenue. So it's kind of interesting. Years ago, I was very fortunate uh, as a, a young person to have a father who was in the order and uh, he used to say to me that kind of the, the cosmic laws are impersonal and they were laws and they didn't pick out who they like who they don't like they didn't kind of do favors to one person and not for another <laughs> And I guess, you know, uh, sacrificing a pig or, or whatever wasn't going to, you know, uh, change any differently than uh, if you, you know, stuck your hand into a flame and, and uh, made a wish before it that it wasn't going to burn, that it still was going to burn. So he pointed out, and, and this is uh, something that I wish we would, we could, with this idea of attuning to the love of God, if you kind of go with this as, as a, I won't say a test or whatever. So one of the first principles we're going to say around this is that God, the cosmic laws are impersonal. Say not indifferent, they're impersonal. And when I say they're not indifferent, they do tend and, and, are directed toward felic the felicity of, of, exper of experience and human beings and nature and, and what people call love. So they're not, they're not indifferent. They, they are purposeful and directional, right? The law of evolution, things like this, there is a direction to them, but they're impersonal in their action. They have no favorites by race, religion, national origin, uh, ethnic group, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, uh, you are no more special. I'm no more special than the, anyone else walking down the street. None of us are. These things are available. Matthew five. So I'm going to now go to Jesus. Some Jesus quotes here because you know, I love uh, you know the wisdom of these things here. And sometimes, obviously, he's drawn from earlier sources himself. But Matthew five forty five says. God maketh his son, this is Jesus, God maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust alike. It's impersonal. Just like gravity is impersonal. This is impersonal, not indifferent, but impersonal. Everyone is equal in this sight. To go back to quote Louis Saad, Louis Claude Simatan also, who said, you know, all of humanity is arrayed around the circumference of a circle, right? All different circumstances, right? Around this circle. He said, but we are all equally distant from the center of the circle. Right? So God maketh his sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and unjust. Matthew 5 45. Then Matthew 3 35. This one's an interesting one. I, you know, as, a, as a young person hearing this and in, in, you know, going to religious service, I, I had to scratch my head at the time and was like, whoa, wow, what is this? But anyway, here it is, Matthew 3, 35. Who is my mother or my brethren? So this is a context as Jesus is out preaching. Some of his disciples say, hey, your mom's over there. Your brother's over there trying to get your attention, Jesus. Okay, Jesus keeps on preaching. I don't know, you know 20 minutes later, thereabouts, whatever. They go, hey, Jesus, your mom's over there. 
uh, your brothers up there trying to get your attention. And he answered, who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked around about on them which sat about him, people he was preaching to, and said, behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and mother. Right. So truly impersonal, impersonality, all. It's not because we had a special relationship. I met you when, so I'm going to treat you differently. Right? All of humanity, all are my brother, my sister, my mother. It's very interesting. And you kind of look at the truth of this, looking at reincarnation. If you kind of look at studies of reincarnation, uh, uh, very often you'll see that people, they're, they're, they show relationships that in one lifetime uh, kind of get shifted in another lifetime. So uh, one's mother in, in this lifetime may turn out to be one's daughter or sister or brother in another lifetime. Very common, when I say common, when you look at the you know, spontaneous recall of past lives and children, very often, uh, it's not uncommon, I should put it this way, that the, the, the grandchild will say to the parent, I was your mother or I was your father. Right, so uh, these relationships that we use to define, which are based on outer material circumstances, right? Uh, ultimately, uh, we must see all of humanity, right? And and I would put it this way to you, because it's you know challenges I dealt with myself and still wrestle with. The challenge is not to love your mother your brother, your sister less is to love everyone else more. Don't love them less, love everyone else more, All right? Don't love them less, love everyone else more. So that's the impersonal as all well, this one in manifestation. I wanna take us also for those of us at Rosicrucians, uh, you may, Recall receiving in your studies uh, the prayer, the Egyptian prayer, ancient prayer, confessions to Matt or truth. And I'm going to just take a little bit of the top and a little bit of the, and the bottom because it, it makes, again, somewhat this point about the laws and impersonality. It begins Homage to thee, O great God, thou master of all truth. I have come to thee, O my God, and brought myself hither that I may become conscious of thy decrees, O laws. I know thee and am attuned with thee and thy two and 40 laws, which exists with thee in this chamber of matter, truth, Matt, another word for truth. So in truth have I come to thine attunement and I brought Matt, the truth in my mind and soul. And then there's a whole recitation of what they call negative affirmations, which I, I hope you are familiar with, or if not, uh, you will be, and it's, it's a very useful tool. But it ends with, I am pure, I am pure, I am pure. My purity is the purity of the holy temple. Now, quote, therefore evil shall not befall me in this world because I, even I, know the laws of God, which are God. All right. So how much of thee, O great God, thou master of all truth, I have come to thee, O my God, and have brought myself hither that I may become conscious of thy decrees. I know thee and attune with thee and thy two and 40 laws, which exist with thee in this chamber of Matt. And again, ending, therefore evil shall not befall me in this world because I, even I know the laws of God, which are God. So this notion of cosmic law and the impersonality of it, right? and its benefits as we attune ourselves. <clears throat> so I'm gonna tie this now back to Jesus for a moment where he said, when he was asked kind of, uh, you know, how white one kind of uh, you know, have, have a, a good spiritual life. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all things will be added unto you. 
So seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness. So we have two parts here, the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness. And I, I went to, to the dictionary uh, and literally just said, let me look up righteousness. Let's see what the dictionary definition is. Merriam-Webster, acting in accord with divine or moral law. So let's keep that in mind. We got to dig a little deeper, right? So let's seek you first the kingdom. So what I'm talking about here is how do we attune with this love, right? Attune with the love of God, All right? We got to get our radio, our CPU here, our consciousness, right? Tuned into this. So there's two things we've been pointed out here and it, they are the right, the right advice. All right. Seek ye first the kingdom. So, you know, we know we hear the kingdom is at hand. And there are many things at hand that we don't perceive. Right. There's all things around us we don't perceive, but that includes this kingdom, uh, which is basically God's imminent presence is always at hand. We call it the God of our heart. The God of our realization is always at hand. Attune with that. So it is always at hand. It is it exists outside of time. It is only there only and always in the now. It is always there at any moment, any place. It is at hand. So this other part was righteousness. Right? Seek the kingdom and its righteousness. And here's where I'm going to ask you to, to follow with me a sort of... Uh, the principle that underlies this, and I just recommend you test it for yourself. And looking at it from observation, this righteousness really gravitates around this this oneness of self. That's capital S kind of. Because remember, so in Matthew 22, 36 to 40, you might recall actually, uh, when Jesus was asked, what are the greatest, what, which commandments is the greatest? And he said, basically, love the Lord with thy God, with thy heart, mind, and soul, and thy neighbor as thyself. Right? If you do those two things, he said, you will kind of get all that you seek. All right? So love the Lord thy God with thy heart, mind, and soul, seek after the kingdom, and love thy neighbor as thyself. So this is, it is perhaps, you, you perhaps have to turn this upside down to understand, to look at it from a different vantage point. I'm sure many of you have already recognized this, is that the expanded awareness of the nature of self uh, ultimately leads us to see our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, there's one cosmic consciousness that is resident in all things. So likely we see how this evolves because we can first see it in our families. We might initially look at the self as just being me, Tom, me, Denise, me, so-and-so, right? That's the self. But when we are part of a family, perhaps we take a spouse, partner, uh, and children, that, that unit becomes the same to us as ourself. We love them as we love ourselves. So the self is expanded. Under some circumstances, the self will expand to one's community. The self, we perceive those others because maybe we share some uh, place where we kind of group around them or with them or nationality or ethnicity, whatever the case may be but we see them as ourselves. And in that sense, the self has expanded further. And we know uh, there are people who will act selflessly for other individuals, right? S sacrificing their own physical lives because they identify with them being as themselves. And these things are very often reported in, in wartime where some individual in a group 
right, jumps on the grenade or whatever the case may be, or the person jumps in front of their child or whatever, right, to sacrifice sacrifice their own life for that other that other individual. They love that person as the as thyself because their sense of self is expanded to include uh, not just themselves in the most finite way. So this cosmic consciousness uh, is really this oneness. Uh, so if we were to realize right now as humans, typically we don't realize that the reason why to love thy neighbor thyself is actually thy neighbor and oneself is the same consciousness. There's only one consciousness. It's the cosmic consciousness we're you know, pointed out in our studies for one, but all of us share this one consciousness. It's of one source. It's one, one source that all the little tributaries come uh, from. So this cosmic consciousness is resonant in all things. Right? It's in matter as the laws of nature. So it's, it's nature is evident to us based on our ability to perceive it. So if we kind of look at this oneness, right? Love thy neighbor thyself because thy neighbor is thyself. You may not originally realize in a child, an infant doesn't realize that that toe on the end of that thing we call its foot is part of it. Of course, if it's struck accidentally and, and injured, the child then realizes it's part of me. So when we realize all these other living things that we share, we are one with them, right? We will treat them differently, right? So this oneness, not separateness, but oneness will determine how we respond to others. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 40, he said, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me, right? This is this oneness of all things which is a really a fun, fun, fundamental law of the creation. So we must act in harmony with this fundamental. As we deviate from it, we invoke karmic events to bring us into alignment. So as looking at how do we come into attunement, this realization of this oneness, if we treat these things and realize as an expansion, an extension, they're all part of oneself, we will find that we begin to, to, to tune our radios, so to speak. None of us, uh, and none of this is outside of the consciousness of, of the creator, right? Everything takes place within it. Uh, Jesus said, Matthew 10, verse, verse 30, not a hair, he said, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So, as we look at this idea of tuning into the love of God, right? If we tune into it, we will see it manifest. Uh, we will be surprised if you know you're not already experienced with this. You may be startled uh, by how this love that seems to be hidden, because our thoughts are discordant, uh, discordant because we are not. <laughs> pointing ourselves toward that central thing of the oneness that we're not you, know, you don't have the beauty of it you don't have to be all the way there by any means you can just kind of make sure now you got your radio tuned in the right vicinity it doesn't require perfection not at all otherwise uh, none of us would be able to provide any evidence right but this notion of how to have this love of god revealed in your everyday life, just as it is, quote unquote, in heaven. So when you go to the near death experience, you go, wow, I can feel this love. The love is available here and now, but you really must attune uh, with this love. And that really brings means bring our consciousness. And as we look at this at Christmas, where it says, speaking of, of the Christ, let the mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. So how do we cultivate that sense of the oneness? Whatever you do, at least tomorrow you do unto me, that oneness. Because we see that oneness, we experience that oneness. We do not treat other things carelessly, right? We value each one of them, right? Because we value, because we sense that oneness. So the smallest animal, uh, anything that's living, 
And ultimately, we know this consciousness in all things, but particularly we see it manifesting through living things, is to realize the oneness we share with those things. Right? It's one consciousness. The forms vary, but it's one consciousness. Because you can see in the characteristics of that consciousness, it's, it's fairly universal no matter what the life form is. So I want to, to suggest something to you. I say about that hopefully for you will will do some of what uh, it, it's 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 surprisingly shockingly for me done for me. I mean, I'm, I'm believe me, I'm like wow, I'm shocked by it myself. And that is to have confidence in cosmic law. And I love uh, you know just like I say like scientists have confidence in the cosmic laws, right? The physics and so on, that they can send a satellite or about to spend, send the, the web tel telescope up into space, or we can send satellites to distant planets, right? It's for us to have also have equal confidence in these cosmic laws. These cosmic laws are real, they're concrete, and what we simply must do is bring ourselves into a tumor with them. And I, I love again this, and for many years, I'm so thankful for uh, this affirmation uh, uh, there again from the cro closing of the crow mat. Therefore, no evil shall befall me in this world because I, even I, know the laws of God, which are God. Right? Even I know the laws of God, which are God. It's, 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 it's built in. That's how the cosmic consciousness works. It's universal. It's not separate. God is not separate. Right? We, we, as to quote, uh, St. Luke uh, the, among the apostles is that which in which we live, move, and have our being. So this really suggests a great reliability can underpin our experience, increase, increasing our trust and removing fear. Right? Because what do human beings seek? We feel vulnerable to all around us, but uh, as we, we attune these laws and this harmony and this oneness, the more we do, the more we see, seek ye first the kingdom, all things come after. It just comes. It just comes. They're just atoms and molecules that the cosmic arranges. They're infinite. They're infinite and they just come. Uh, and I, I guess that our grandmaster will close us off with this other part. Uh, and that's the Rosicrucian chant. And but I will wait for her to lead it because it would, would be not good for your ears for me too. Uh, oh, love that knoweth of no fear. Oh, love that sheds a joyous tear. Oh, love that makes me whole and free. Such love shall keep and hallow me. Peace profound, my brothers and sisters, friends and sororas. Uh, happy holidays and may God bless us.